greet everyone in the precious name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I'd like to start reading from Philippians chapter 3 and we're going to talk about putting no confidence in the flesh. This is the absolute truth of God's Word. It is once and for all settled in heaven. We should always have the understanding that there is no question or argument with the Word of God. And it is knowing this truth, it will set you free to walk in the liberty and the freedom that God has for you. In Philippians chapter 3, I'm going to read a few verses. Furthermore, my brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. Rejoice in the Lord. Can you imagine? This is a man who is in prison. He is in the Philippian jail and he is asking us to rejoice in the Lord. And it says that in Paul, his circumstances did not dictate how his emotions and what he was asked of the Lord to do. He says, rejoice in the Lord. What is his secret? How can he rejoice in such an, a dire situation such as prison? He had an encounter with the risen Christ on the road to Damascus. So he started understanding who this Jesus Christ was and he made a commitment to know him personally. That is the key. Once you get a glimpse of who Jesus is, you will never turn back to your old way of life. His mind was transformed from being earthly minded to being heavenly minded. That's why in Colossians chapter 3, it says, set your things on uh, things above, not on things of this earth. This is progressive sanctification. When that starts to happen, what you used to like, you won't like anymore. What you used to crave in the worldly sense, you don't have that desire anymore because our affections are being set towards heaven and what is accepted by heaven which is holy and pure he knew his strength his strength when it was when he was weak because then the manifest power of christ could reign in him and he could overcome situations he's saying rejoice in the lord and he makes that commitment it is no longer i who live but christ who lives in me such devotion such passion he didn't turn back to his old way of life and he pressed towards the upward call of Christ to do what uh, he was entrusted to do. Now he's encouraging all of us rejoice in the Lord. And then it says, it is no trouble for me, no trouble for me to write the same things to you again. So he is reinforcing and he is letting the people know, even though I have to repeat certain things, I want you to get what I'm trying to say to you so that you will not falter in your faith and other people who may try to dissuade you won't be able to do that. He's telling them stand firm. So it says, and it is for, it is to save, it's a safeguard for you. And he wants to protect them in their commitment to the Lord Jesus Christ that nothing, nothing can dissuade them. And it says, in verse 2, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutil mutilators of the flesh. Those are some strong words. Watch out for the dogs. And why would he use such forceful language? Strong words. These are three warnings of three types of people that we should stay away from. And if you ever gone to a, probably a, a city where the dogs run free, especially the stray dogs, you start to get worried. These are not the uh, dogs that we have as pets, but these are scavenger dogs. They are disease ridden and they just run in packs and you get scared because if they bite you, then you have more issues to deal with. So what he's telling him, who does he associate these, the word dogs to? He says, watch out, beware of these people who will assault you in their words and deeds, and they will cause you to lose your joy. These are the people who are totally negative minded, those who have no affinity towards the word of God and the purpose of God, or even within the church. These are people who always try to find the negative in these things. And he's saying, watch out for those people because they will try to cause you to lose your joy. 
And then it says, watch out for men who do evil. Evil. These are legalists. They keep emphasizing that you're saved by works. These are the people, even in our Christian realm, that put quotas on how the spiritual walk should be. You should have read your Bible. You should have prayed. It's like a, a, a list of things that you have to do to come close to God because enough is never enough in their sight. Sometimes it could be your attitude they don't like. It's, it's like they have a way of saying this is what holiness should look like and they cause people to stumble. They are legalists. They have a way of thinking that is so thwarted Sometimes they think it's the outward adornment of wearing certain type of attire that makes you holy. No, it is inside the heart. God with his eyes sees you through and through. He examines you through and through. David, when he was uh, being anointed as king, God looked at his heart. He was a man after God's own heart. He had his misgivings and his failings, but God saw his repentant heart. So it says, watch out for these evildoers. And it says, what they try to do is they try to say works and more works. You have to work towards your salvation. You, you're never good enough to be in the sight of God. And Apostle Paul is warning, do not the, stay away from these evil people. And the third group, they are the mutilators of the flesh. Israelites, when they, before the coming of Christ, the way the demarcation from the rest of the world was they circumcised the male child on the eighth day. And that was a sign saying that they were separated unto God. Now these uh, mutilators of the flesh, basically they're saying is that circumcision is what is needed for salvation and not the circumcision of the heart, the true repentant heart. So basically, they're just mutilating their flesh and not having an ounce of relationship with God. He's saying these people who are holding on to this law of circumcision prior to Christ, it was just when they were called out to be a people, it was a demarcation saying that they were set apart. But then the important thing was circumcision of the heart. But they're taking this to another level saying that without circumcision, you cannot come to God. And then he goes on to say, it says, for we are we it for it is we who are the circumcision who serve God by his spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in my flesh, though I myself have reason for such confidence. So true circumcision is of the heart and the transference of the spirit. When you accept Jesus Christ as your personal savior, that is the true circumcision where your heart is totally converted and you start to have the works of repentance coming out. That is what Apostle Paul is saying. Stay away from these people who will cause such a downer in your faith that you will lose your joy and you will not have that desire to continue to grow in his grace. These are the people who, who you need to stay away from. And we've discussed that in detail. And what Paul is saying is that eternal life is based on what Christ has done for us, not what we have done for him. God's gift of eternal life is with him. The example I will share with you is about Martin Luther. He was a Catholic monk. Actually, he was a Catholic. And he wanted so much to get to know God. And he thought that, how can I earn this salvation? Then he became a monk, and then he fasted for many, many days and even months. He had a prayer life. He even inflicted physical wounds on his body, but he found no peace. And he's like, what can I do? And then he would go to confession. How can I get to know this God? How can I get to know this God? Then he opened Romans chapter 117. It says, the just shall live by faith. Faith that we put our trust in the saving grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and what he has done on Calvary as the finished work. So there is nothing, nothing we need to do to earn the salvation. That's what Apostle Paul is saying. Stay away from people who add, who say that faith plus works. 
faith. Yes, in the Bible it says you have to do have works of repentance. But in order to have the saving grace of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the salvation experience, it is a free gift. We accept it by faith. There's a lot of different denominations who teach you have to do this, you have to do that. Faith plus works gets you to salvation. No, that becomes legalistic. You're trying to earn something that has already been done for you. Don't do that. Don't do that. And then it says, um, hence, when Martin Luther finally got this liberation, that was the beginning of the Protestant Reformation. So I'm going to end with this. I want to share with, I want you to have some take home points is that the gift of salvation was done on the cross of Calvary. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So what do we do if you have not accept this precious gift of salvation? You believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead and that you cannot live a life on your own in this perverse world. You need the Holy Spirit. You need God's Spirit to come and live inside of you. First of all, you confess with your mouth. You say, Lord, I am a sinner. I don't know how to live in this world. I want you to come and live inside of me and transform me, change me into the person that you want me to become. When you confess that with your mouth and you believe the finished work on Calvary is enough for our uh, sin, it's payment in full. The Holy Spirit will come and start living inside of you. He will start to do the things, the changes. He will start doing the change. So what you have to do is trust him as your savior. Savior is the one that saves you where nobody else can. It's the saving grace of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So if anyone who is hearing me right now does not have the salvation experience, accept Jesus into your heart. Pray that prayer. Say, Lord, I want you to come live inside of me. I want to live the rest of my life for you. I'm not going to base my faith in you by doing things to achieve that salvation experience. It's a free gift. And then what you do is after you do that, the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of you. How do you get to know him? Read the love book he's given you, the Bible. It is the absolute truth. It is God's love letter to you. Read it, read it, read it till your mind gets transformed. It gets transformed, renewed daily. All the washing of the word will make you think like him. I pray that you will do that. Make that prayer of commitment and just say, Lord, I love you and I want to live for you. And go to a Bible-believing church who will help you to grow in corporate worship together and in Bible study. I pray that the Lord will strengthen you. We'll pick up the rest of the verses from Philippians chapter 3. And I thank, it. I, I thank you for listening to me. It's such a privilege to share the Word of God with you. May the Lord bless you and have a wonderful, wonderful week ahead.